And so I want to start with a quote by Ernest Holmes, and it's out of Living the Science of Mind. And I want you to remember when he uses the word Christianity, you could really put any religion or spiritual belief in there that you choose. At the time he wrote this, he was living in the United States, and we were probably still our predominantly Christian country. If the philosophy of Christianity were lived, wars would cease, unhappiness would cease, economic problems would be solved, poverty would be wiped from the face of the earth, and man's inhumanity to man would be transmuted into a spirit of mutual helpfulness. And so much like when uh, Cynthia then takes what Ernest says and brings it forward into words that we might understand more clearly today, although that was pretty clear. Um, I don't know how many of you have the CD, Whitey Ford Sings the Blues? Yeah, I didn't think so. Um, <laughs> I didn't know when I bought it. There was a song on that CD that really touched my heart. And I didn't know when I bought it that Whitey Ford was the lead singer for Everlast, and they're a rap group, and I would never, I didn't think, buy a rap album. But what he says is, God forbid you ever had to walk a mile in his shoes. Because then you really might know what it's like to sing the blues. That's living compassion. Is to put yourself in somebody else's shoes. And so I was struggling this week because I talked about compassion last Sunday and I thought oh again must be needed <laughs> and where do I go I mean you know I thought I'd kind of touched on everything and then the book of the month and it is in the Life Abundant Bookstore is called Ordinary Goodness and it's written by Reverend Dr. Edward Blaheen I have trouble with his last name I apologize Edward um, and it is brilliant and so a lot what I'm going to talk about today are Edward's stories about ordinary compassion. How do we do that? And one of the things he talked about is his example was he had a friend that lived in San Diego and he wanted him to come to the San Diego Zoo. I don't do zoos, Edward said. I don't like to watch animals that should be free. I don't like to see them caged up. And so the friend convinced him by telling him that what they were doing was learning how to bring back animals that were endangered. There was conservation going on. And so Edward went with a set of new eyes. What that triggered for me is how I, when, I, when something is uncomfortable for me, then what I do is pull back and say, I I'm not going to do that. For instance, movies. So there's a new movie ca out called Detroit. And it's based on a true story. And it's man's inhumanity towards man. And the little I th thought of it, my whole body just went into, how could we do this to each other? I'm not going to see that movie. And then I thought, to be truly compassionate, to really walk in somebody else's shoes, no matter how uncomfortable that makes me, I need to go see that movie because it gives me a deeper understanding of something that I know exists and makes me angry and unhappy with our man's inhumanity to man, which Carol so brilliantly talked about in that poem that we talked about last Sunday, just like me. And so I am going to step up and go to that movie because no matter how uncomfortable it makes me, maybe I need to be uncomfortable to be more compassionate. Instead of just being uncomfortable and saying, I'm uncomfortable, I'm not going to see it, and so I'm sure it was a really good movie. And I've done that with a lot of movies. Any movie, actually, that's based on a true story. I mean, I can talk to you about movies and TV shows, and you'll, you would think, well, what's the difference? They aren't true. They're fantasy. You know, they might be violent in some respects. They might be funny. They might be heart-wrenching. They're not real. And I get that so I can sit through them. It's the real ones that make me angry. 
And so compassion and, a- and action is facing that. And when something makes you uncomfortable, instead of shrinking away and say, I'm not going to do that, is stepping in and saying, what if I face this? How will that shift my energy? How will that make me more engaged in a situation that goes on all the time? And it's not just this country. Every country. We've got man's inhumanity to man or women. You know when I say that, I'm talking about all people. And so that was the first thing that hit me was how to be compassionate with myself and to show up so I can be more compassionate with other people. It is one thing to have discussions with somebody and understand the life they lived may be different than the life I've lived. And it's different when you put yourself in a movie theater and you get to live that life through the brilliance of producers and directors and actors. And so it's one of the things that I found in this brilliant little book, Ordinary Goodness, that ordinary compassion is, you know, stepping up and being present. And when you're uncomfortable, instead of shrinking back, stepping into it, because if you're uncomfortable, there's a calling there. And it's calling you loud. The more comfortable, uncomfortable you are, the louder that call is. And so pick up the phone and say hello to your uncomfortableness. And so the next thing he talked about, and we've talked about this a lot, and it's about truly listening. Compassion in action is about truly listening. And I loved his story. He went to school to be a chaplain. And he said chaplain training is brilliant because they really teach you how to be with other people. Really sit with somebody and listen. And so Edward went through all the training, and as is true when you go through ministerial school and they tell you, oh, this will never happen, and we're going to tell you about this anyway, and then it's the first thing that pops up um, when you serve, just be prepared, Bernie, because it happens to us all. Um, That he got a gentleman that was uh, in hospice, And he went to be with him, and he said this man had a huge personality and just, you know, just was very loud and outspoken about his disease and about dying. And and Edward was an introvert, or is an introvert. And so Edward sat there, thinking to, you know, being with the person, letting him be this energy all around him, and sat there and listened. And, and brought any time his mind water, he'd bring himself back and just listen. Really listen to what he was saying. And when the, me- when the meeting was over and Edward left and he was in his car and he thought to himself, oh, that really didn't go well. I'm going to have to go back to chaplain school. I'm sure he's going to call my supervisor and tell them, you know, I just failed on all kinds of different levels. And the guy did call his supervisor and commented how brilliant Edward was to just listen to him and let him work through his disease, the fact that he was dying. He said, and he just sat there with compassionate eyes and let me work through it without offering help without telling me what I should do or what I shouldn't do or how I should behave. He just let me be. That is the gift of really listening. And I don't know about you, I sometimes forget that. Because we all think we're a little bit brilliant, do we not? And yet when you sit with somebody, if you really let them talk, and every time you want to speak, maybe bite your tongue, or pinch yourself, you'll be amazed how brilliant they are. And all they really want, all any of us really wants, is to be heard. And we are so busy sharing our experiences, our brilliance, our I can fix this for you, that we forget the brilliance of the person that's trying to talk to us. And so it's a practice to truly listen to somebody with your heart. 
to look them in the eye and let them tell you what's going on in their life, why they're angry, why they're upset, why whatever's going on, and just let them have that space. And let them work through it with their words. Because when they work through it with their words, then their soul is working through it. If I come in with my words, I've just interrupted their process. And yet I know, because I've done it in class, I've done it in coaching sessions, I've done it with friends, I forget. I forget. And I don't think I'm the only one that forgets. We're all brilliant. We all want to be heard. And so it's just allowing that space to sit with somebody and really look at them and think, wow. Just imagine if you sat with somebody and your only thought in your head was, God's talking to me right now. I wonder what brilliant things God has to say. Because remember, if we believe, and I do, we're all God in form, then every time somebody talks to you, God's talking to you. Sometimes God can be a little angry. Sometimes God can be a little hurt or confused. And yet that soul in there, if you let it talk, will work it out. It just wants to be heard. And so, as I said, I was going to use a lot of Edward's stories because I think that he's brilliant in, in this book. I, I haven't read any of his other books, but if this is any indication, it's brilliant. So he talks about compassion in action and how many times, I don't know about you, something goes on in the world and I think I should be there. I think I should be on the front line. I think I should you know, go and protest and, and stand in the middle of winter with um, the Sioux. And, you know, just there are places that I think I should be and I, and I don't go. But what can we do if we don't go? Because a lot of times we think if I can't be there, then I don't need to do, I shouldn't do anything. There's nothing to do if I can't be there holding up a sign or standing there shoulder to shoulder with them, then what's the point? So there's two stories. One is about a young man that goes to an ashram and there's, there's a monk there and he's cleaning and cooking and doing all the work and he says to the monk, don't you resent those other monks up on the hillside that just are cloistered and they don't do anything they're just they're just sitting there praying all day and all night and and we're down here working and he said of course not they're holding the foundation so that I can do what I need to do and so the foundation of what we teach here is prayer and so if you ever feel so overwhelmed with something that's going on in the world and how unfair it is, and how awful it is, or how this should be done, or that should be done. Instead of talking about it and adding more energy to it, what if you just prayed? What if you just prayed? The way we pray here, affirmative. And so I know that you all, I assume all of you know who Greg Braden is. No? Greg Braden writes um, great spiritual books, and he lives in the high desert of northern New Mexico. That's how he introduces himself. He actually lives in Taos, in case you were wondering. He's really good friends with the Pueblo Indi Indian tribe there. And when it was really, really, really dry in New Mexico, as it gets almost every single summer, his friend said, I, I want to go out and... Um, and pray for rain. Will you come with me? And Greg said, absolutely, I would love that. And so they go out onto a high mesa. And his friend stands there. And never says a word. Just stands there. For about a half hour. And Greg's kind of thinking, so when are we going to start praying? And so when it's done, packs up the stuff and they're walking down and Greg says, 
could I ask you something? I said, sure. I thought we were going to pray. He said, I was. He said, you didn't say a word. He said, I was standing there feeling the rain. I was feeling my feet covered in mud. I was feeling my hair so soaked with rain, it was laying against my face. That's how we pray here. If you want to shift the energy of the world or this country or your family or whatever it is that you go, um, I don't know, cuckoo on, you know, you kind of get all riled up because it's not the way you think it should be. Then do a prayer about what you intend for this country or for your family or for your relationship. In the positive, act as if. Act as if everything's normal. And so there is that if I, if I feel I can't do anything, the one thing I can always do is pray. The one thing I can always do is shift my energy. The one thing I should avoid doing is spewing more hatred or more comments or more whatever onto already what is an ugly situation. Remember what we teach here is if you're going to keep wherever you put your energy it's going to grow so how many of us have something in our life that we are constantly commenting on because it's in our face all the time have you ever noticed the news doesn't really tell us any anything good that's going on the news is about what's wrong and then we add to that with our own commentary and so if we could stop doing that if we can start to be that container for unconditional love, which we say is the vision of this community, if we can be that, then certainly we can start to shift the energy within ourselves, within our relationships, within this community, and it will go outward. But we're all, we can only be responsible for ourselves and how we behave, what we say. What's the first thought that comes out of our... Or the, the words that come out of our mouth. How often do we gossip? Edwin Gaines in her book, The Four Laws of um, the Four Spiritual Laws of Prosperity, and I th and I believe also um, in the Four Agreements. Gossip is poison. It's poison, and it's not based on fact. Gossip is just what it is. It's gossip. You're sharing somebody else's story, and if you don't like the person, you're going to tell it with that tone of, I don't like them. And if you do like them, you're going to make it even more exaggerated than it is. It's still gossip. Unless it's your living experience, it's not yours to share. And so compassion in action is taking responsibility for, how do I show up in the world? And then the last story he says is to be compassionate even when you're afraid and this story broke my heart because I didn't know this about Edward until I read this book or actually just this chapter Edward was raised in South Africa at the time of apartheid and in South Africa at that time if you were white regardless of your financial situation you got to go to school South Africa would pay for it entirely. And so Edward was allowed to go to school. Edward had no idea his family was poor. And so they went out on this adventure, the whole class, out into the bush, and it was remarkable. And then the leader said, in nature, species do not mix with other species. It's unnatural. And Edward, little boy, eight or nine, pops up and says, but my grandfather raises parakeets. And the guy looked at him like, don't you dare challenge me. And he couldn't stop. And so he looked at him and he said, but my grandfather raises parakeets. And we have, he has fun when he mates a red one with a yellow one because we never know what color the new babies are going to be. Of course we can mix. 
from that day forward, Edward found out not only was he poor because the kids started to tease him, he also found out that everybody knew that he was gay because they started to comment about he was half girl. And so one day he was sitting as they started to bully him. They came up and they started to surround him and bully him. And he kept telling himself, I will not cry. I will not cry. And the tears started to stream down his face. And he thought, this is going to be awful. And all of a sudden, this young boy came and sat right next to him and said, oh, you're playing marbles. And they started to talk. And what Edward noticed was that little boy's hands were shaking. He was scared too. But not so scared that he was going to let Edward be there alone. Not so scared he would let this little boy be bullied. And so how many times in our life do we have an opportunity when we hear somebody say something unkind to another human being to step in and say, that's just not true. How dare you say that? So this is, compassion in action is up to us. It's our responsibility. God forbid you ever had to walk a mile in his shoes. Then you really might know what it's like to have the blues. Be compassion. You have a choice. Be that. So let's pray. So right here and right now, feeling the spirit of that unconditional love, that thing itself that I choose to call God, that I just allow to bubble up inside me with the joy, the compassion, the love, the knowingness that just like me, there is you. Just like God lives and breathes and has its existence in and through and as me, it has its existence in and through and as you. How could it not? It is that energy. It is that thing itself. It really doesn't have a name. It is something powerful. Something we feel within ourselves. That calling, that intuitive push. That brilliance that we wonder, where did that come from? And so in knowing that, in knowing that we are always part of, of this human race, that we all are here together, cousins 50 times removed, every single one of us, regardless of what we look like, regardless of who we choose to love, we are it in form and we are here to be that together. And so I just embrace that. I love that. I know that. And I know that for each of you. That you start to feel that compassion within your soul. And allow it to burst forth through your body. And to touch the souls around you. And to know that that calling is the calling of the divine, calling back to itself, seeing itself. As you look through the eyes of God, seeing and knowing God looking back at you. And so knowing this is the truth, I just say thank you, God. Father, Mother, Spirit within me for holding and knowing this truth, for being blessed to always realize that I am a, a practice, always learning, always saying yes, always available. And so in that, I am so grateful as I turn these words over. I let them go. I let them be. I surround them in love. And together we say, and so it is.